All right, so she has two meetings at once. Shall we start the meeting then? Yeah. All right. Uh, so this is the Finance Committee meeting for November 30th. Um, we have minutes to approve, nicely submitted by Councilor Connor. I'll take a motion to approve. So move. Um, what was the date of the meeting? 11, 11, 23. Okay. Last Monday. Did, did you make a motion, Omar? Yes. Second. Motion made and second to approve the minutes. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none. Councilor Gomez? Aye. Councilor Connick? Aye. Councilor Riss says aye. Is anyone here from the public to speak tonight? Now is your time. No. Okay. Well, the mayor has two meetings at once, which means uh, she won't be participating, but all we're going to talk about is the 121A agreement, which I will bring up. I want Mike, Jane, and Jeff, you're primarily here to answer questions. Your presentation was very thorough. I enjoyed it immensely. And I welcome the fact that we're finally going to get these buildings done. Um, as chair of the committee, I have no problem. I read over the agreement thoroughly. It seems to be very thorough. Um, there's lots of great language in it, uh, legal language against default, protecting the city, default, gap payments, et cetera. Um, this counselor has no questions regarding those. Uh, I like the fact that we ended up at 25 years. I know that at one point you had requested 40 years and the mayor came back with 20 years and we ended up at 25 years. Then, sorry, uh, Nicole said that she's gonna be here soon. Okay. Um, so when she comes, I'll ask her to step in, but I mostly feel comfortable with this. It really takes a blighted area and turns it, it's perfect. I've been on the, I've been in the city 42 years and it's always been a mess. We've had two or three other developers try to do something with it and their financing didn't come through. Your project to me is quite welcome. I'm going to call up because Jen is now here. I'm going to share the screen with the document that I want to uh, go over. Are you all seeing this? Yep. I will move this to any part of the contract you'd like, but my, my questions are on the numbers and I'll let Jane, uh, Jane start. Um, what's the difference between 121A payments, five to 10% and adjusted payment to the city? So one of them is the first, the 121M, wait, one, excuse me, 121A payment, 5% and 10 per 1K is the excise tax payment of the, so there's two different payments under 121A. There's the excise payment, and then there's the additional payment under um, section 6A of the of 121A that is an additional payment to the city. Okay, so first year, the city gets both of these figures. Correct. Okay, that's what I wasn't sure about. Thank you. Yep. Nicole is here. And it looks like um, our treasurer is here. Again, we catch up here in 2037 and we make more than, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I misunderstood this, so that's not really a thing. It looks like eventually we're up to 167 at the end of this contract, which is more than half of the actual value. And I saw how the uh, assessed value was made. It's based on 1.5% CPI, one point tax increase. Are you comfortable with this, Jen, this entire document? Um, yes, I worked um, quite a bit with Jeff Daly and um, Jane, kind of back and forth on some of the numbers that, you know, um, originally didn't sit well with us and more it was in terms of the length of the um the proposed length of the um agreement um and just to just to kind of piggyback off of what jane said so those two columns that you see 
the, the one on the far right, the last column is paid directly to the city. The one on the left, the 121A payments actually do come back to us, but they go through the Commonwealth. They go do what DOR first. Right. It's all excise tax payments. Hmm? Okay. So is, we're calling this a pilot because it's not a real, it's a payment. Right. New of, so this is really a, a tax exemption schedule, shall we say? Hmm? Okay. This is the crux of the agreement. My last question, let me get to it. What is this? Oh, that is for, um, that's for the diff portion. Now, 121A and, and the diff are two completely different things. The okay. diff is financing that we secure um, based around the fact that it's a, uh, develop a development district um and then this is just showing this is just estimating that um the amount is 1.3 million that holds but we're seeing at a possible rate of two percent um when i spoke with jeff i had said that i would most likely do a ban for the first two years and then bond for the final eight but i didn't want to go out more than 10 years on 1.3 million because that's not a ton of money in terms of bonds um so this this is just the schedule of what those payments back would look like so if you look at these figures compared to um, what we're bringing in, I mean, overall, the net is still more to the city. So I'm going to play dumb here. The diff is a separate thing that the city's doing to help this happen. What does it, I don't know if it's you to answer this or the mayor. I, I can jump in, uh, Council Arista, if you'd like. This is Jeff Daly. Uh -huh. um, the diff is to finish the public infrastructure work that the town has committed to, which had a value of about 1.3. The Mass Works was the first uh, slug, if you will, of investment. Okay. Uh, and the 1.3 is the balance of the work of the public infrastructure work. So it's for public use, um, public infrastructure work that would be done in order to support this development. Uh, and, and what Jen just described is, is exactly it. You, you would do the town committed to a $1.3 million diff and the town would go out to borrow at whatever given time. And then it would pay itself back through the excess, uh, excess tax generated off of the project. So it's not going to taxpayers across the town. It's basically what Mike is paying in taxes back to the city would pay that debt service over those eight years. So, so the eight years, that's what you're meaning, Jen, is the eight years of pilot money, excise tax money is more than this is going to cost us. Correct. Well, the the overall, I didn't do the first 10 years, but I know the payments, because the payments start off, mm -hmm. it, the payments to us from Mike and the 121A start off lower. Um, I do think that, I mean, they, they catch up within the next year after that or two if that but overall is what i'm saying we end up in the, in the i just didn't understand what it was so if i and i'll get to you in a second peg uh if i understand it then once construction begins we're going to take this out to do the town's city's portion of the infrastructure that's necessary for the remaining construction once this project begins correct that's correct hey I'm done with all my questions. So stay here, Dan. Okay. So in a sentence, we are spending $1.5 with interest, $1.3 plus interest, to get $5.1 back over 25 years. So Mike's payment, Mike's payment, whatever we want to call Mike's payment, so this. Yep. Over time, we get 121A payments to the tune of 2.484 and a pilot payment, if you will, of 2.464 all in is about 5.13 million. That's the good to the city and the city has to spend 1.2 million plus interest to make improvements to kind of pretty up what Mike is doing in terms of a development. So really what we're talking about here is spending one point whatever to get five point whatever. 
Okay, that that makes more sense to me than all of the other stuff. Um, so okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Um, my other question then maybe is to you, Jen, and I just want to make sure that I fully understand. Dan, can you go to the prior chart? So, and Mike, I'm just going to say Mike, but I know that there's a corporation and all other things are happening. But in the far right column where it says adjusted payment to city, that's a check that Mike writes instead of giving us taxes every year. The column to the left of that is a payment we get because we've entered into this agreement. And where is that money coming from? If I may, um, that is also coming from Mike. Um, Mike. Again, Jane. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jane Mantaleski again. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, that, that first payment um, in the essentially the fifth column, right? The 121A payment. Mike also makes that payment. That payment just goes to the Department of Revenue first. There's a, a okay. form, an X, a 121A excise form that we actually have to complete. Um, and then that goes to, that payment goes to DOR on March 15th. And um, then they take that payment and give it back to the city. Um, then the, the last column, again, is another payment by Mike. It just goes directly to the town as opposed, to, as, as opposed to having to go through DOR first. So both of those payments are made by Mike under a general 121A statutory scheme. Okay. Um, and is this... This um, all of these rows with the municipal tax rate per thousand, is that a we think that's what it will be or so are these numbers absolute or are they a function of whatever it turns out to be in column two? Uh, Jeff Daly yeah. can give you more explanation on uh, th those numbers, but the numbers that are in columns five and six, right, those last two columns, those would be the payments. Um, so, but Jeff can give you more explanation on the other things. In other words, the property values you've got here, if I can understand, take a question. These property values, are they fixed or do they change with time? Is it part of this agreement? If, if, if you can scroll down, Councillor uh, Chris, just a little bit, in a little bit more. So right there, that's perfect, thank you. Okay. So what we're doing is, uh, Jen and I looked at the tax rates over the last, 10, I think it was years Jen sent over. And on average, other than when you did the exemption or the override, uh, we, we figured it was about 1.25. And that's a safe, safe assumption because you only can go two and a half and it's rare that it goes to zero. So about 1.25 rate of increase. And the other assumption that we did that carries out throughout the life is a one and a half percent CPI increase uh, on the value of, of the investments throughout the life of, of the 21A. So those are, are not science. Obviously, some years your tax rate could go up 2%. Other okay. years it may go up 0.75% or 0.75%. So it's not locked in, but it's the best assumption that we could do to get a fair value that would look close to what we think is going to happen over the next 20 years. But does that mean that the contract is fixed, that the value of this property so that you have a fixed knowledge of what you have to pay over the 25 years which helps your financing these excess values do not change i would think is that correct i mean even though they might change literally they don't change but based on the contract am i correct in that assumption the, the values should not change but the tax amount could if that makes sense so if, if for instance in 2023 i have 1892 it, if you, it could go to 1896 per thousand, or it could go to 1758 per thousand if you went down in taxes. So those are the only fluid. The values we increased at one and a half percent, which is CPI, which is normal carry uh, for the value of the buildings. And I think the only, I think Jen, did we send? I thought I thought we sent you the, and I don't want to muddy the waters, but I think we carried out the building five coming on in, in 2023 as opposed to 22. Um, Jane, I think we sent it over, but we can amend that and put it in. I think it was sent over to this town already. But to answer your question, yes, those values are essentially locked in. And the, the only thing that could be a variable is the changing tax rate based on what you counselors do in the next 25 years. I can't... But that doesn't change the amounts here. Go ahead, Peg. So I, 
I really, I'm getting more confused. So let me just ask my question and then okay. you guys can go okay. off on a tangent. Um, I just want to know how much money we're getting year over year. And so all I want to know is, are we getting 2.4 million from the 121 and 2.46 million from directly from Mike, regardless of what happens in columns two and three, and you have negotiated based on those numbers, a rate in column four, or are you telling me that these are just estimates and as one and two go, that will change column three? Like I'm trying to understand what we can count on versus how you arrived at what we can count on. Does that make sense? So it, it, you guys negotiated based on, hey, City of East Hampton, we made assumptions that your tax rate's gonna go up 1.25 and the property will increase a certain amount. And so this is the tax you would otherwise get, East Hampton, if we were paying the tax and that's what we're gonna pay. So is it possible that our tax rate goes down, but you are still committed to what's ever in column four. That's what I'm trying to understand. Does it fluctuate? And this is just an example or, yeah, help me out. Anyway. Um, thanks. <laughs> so how it should work is that these, that you negotiate a payment with the town and a developer negotiates a payment with the town and that negotiation takes into account um, whether or not like there's going to be an increase or a decrease. You kind of come up to this number yeah. um, based upon those assumptions. And so how it, those payments, and again, you know, Jeff can chime in here too, but those payments, um, five and six column, those should be the payments. Those should be the fixed payments that go through because I believe under the Jeff spreadsheet, how it went down is the increase has been accounted for the presumed increase. So there may be, um, you know, a year where the tax rate does go down for whatever reason, but you negotiated a higher number. Mm -hmm. Um, but there might be a year where the number goes higher and you're lower. Um, so that's so, so we care about the last two columns. That's the money that we can plan on. That's yes, that's correct. What I what my understanding of what Jeff's spreadsheet was is yes. That's your understanding, Jen Gallant? Yes. These, these numbers are what the city's gonna get every year, regardless of what the new tax rate is, regardless of what the property values change. These are fixed by contract. Yes. The, 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 the only thing, counselors, that I just want to point out is, you know, these, so again, Jeff, you know, the, the point is that, you know, the, the 2022, uh, these will be pushed down a, another year. So in other words, 2021, the value 896 will also be in the 2022 column. And these numbers that we have here are only after we have certificate of occupancy. So let's say, for instance, we have some crazy thing that happens like a pandemic and stops our construction project. You know what I mean? So this, this will continue, but it'll just be pushed off for the following year. So the 25 years begins once you have a CO, certificate of occupancy? We have them now. So it is, the 25 years will be starting now. Um, yeah, for 2021, but the, um, and the number, the push down, we did provide a, a new chart to the city. So there is one, um, push down of a year, I think, but in the end, the numbers at the, the bottom, that 2.48 number and 2.46 number, those numbers still, um, remained the same. Okay. Um, just Correct. we pushed down one of the, the numbers on a year for value. So one year is just different. Um, but for some, however it worked out, the numbers maintained the same. Um, so, but yeah, so the, the, the term under the contract is when, um, Mike confirm for me buildings three and five get the COs. Correct. So I think for 2021, we should be ready to go for that year. I have one new question. Yes. It doesn't relate to the numbers. Do any of the other counselors want to talk to the numbers? My question has to do with contract language. If you don't mind, Councilor Rust, I, I do have yeah. 
Go ahead. Another question. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Jane, your last statement, uh, is the reason why the numbers resolve to be the same in the end uh, that it would now take until 2046 to pay it off? Or is it just that the amount is slightly more in each subsequent year after 2022? Uh, it's only 20, 2045. Um, that's the okay. term. Um, and Jeff, that's a question to you. <laughs> You're muted, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it, it would change. It would basically, we, I, I don't have the formula at the other form in front of me, but we're pushing the 896 to 2022. And then the, essentially the 2829 would start the following year. So you would, you would have another duplicate payment of 16,540 based plus the increase in the, in the value that we have. Um, and then in 2023 is when Mike would get the CO and that would begin on building, I think it's called five, um, and that's so we would we would lose the a, va a percentage of the fifty two thousand that's under twenty twenty two now basically twenty twenty one numbers would just get pushed forward into twenty twenty two so there would be a slight a slight decrease in in those numbers um, for so one year mean... and then it Sorry. would go back up no and then it would go back up to normal okay but the overall aggregate amount in the bottom would that mean that that then decreases slightly or that it stays the same? It would decrease slightly. It would decrease by, uh, what are we looking at? 16, probably 18, maybe 20,000, 25,000. Yeah. About 25. Yeah. I, I didn't it stay the same on the spreadsheet. I cannot, I, I don't, Jeff, I'll, do have, you have, I'll, Jeff? I'll have to look. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff Bag, do you have the spreadsheet that shows uh, 2022 still uh, with a value of the 896 or? 896? No, no, you're right. So I'm, it was my error. So yes, they do decrease slightly twenty thousand dollars each. Yes. Right. Can you send that new spreadsheet to the council? It doesn't affect my consideration. It's just nice to know what the overall bottom line is, and I, I assume. Just to follow up on Tom's question, that our payments don't begin until 2022, or our payments do begin on 21, but they're just a little different. 2021. Yeah. The, the, the payments will start this April and this March. Okay, cool. Uh, any other questions on numbers before I go to my question? Um, I'm. Um... I'm sorry. I, I hope I'm not being uh, super dense here. Um, I, I'm just looking at this uh, in uh, what would be column the 5% and $10 per 1K payment. Yeah, that, that, that column. I just want to triple check that I understand this correctly before it goes to the full council that that is like that's, that's the, um, the dollar amount that the city will receive and that it's based on these estimated things, but if the amounts, like if, if those values or those rates end up coming in differently, that this will still, that will still be the calculation that we receive. In other words, there's no uh, contingency that's going to alter that. Correct. Okay, and, thank you. Um, I don't know if you were here, these are excise taxes that go to the DOR and then mm -hmm. come back to us this is direct payments to the city. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, thanks for just restating that. I just, I heard that and I wanted to make sure that I understood this. Erica, Omar, anything on the numbers? My question has to do with the language for, and I don't know what page it's on, the language for the uh, workforce housing and affordable housing. And I want to know if that's fixed in stone, the amount of units that are required by that language and if somebody knows the page that that's on and i'm talking about this page page eight page eight i think it's page eight i believe i think it's six i won't home in on it six eight document <laughs> or page six, six, of dot, the six dot a was the section where it's talked about a little bit this is page six Oh, that's you're at a different six. Sorry, six of the PDF. Yeah. 
Okay. On, if you're going to go to the 6A agreement that you were just on, that is, uh, it's on page two, where we talk about um, workforce housing. Page two of the agreement? Of the 6A agreement, yes. Um, so that's the application. So here's 6A. Nope, that's the application. So I'm going down to the agreement. Yep, so that should be an exhibit. 6A agreement right here. This? No, so the, the document you were just on with the chart? I think he's there actually, sorry, Dan. I think you're right there. If you go to section six of that document you have, I, we broke it up a little bit from the large packet. Show me and, here. And, yeah, right there. That one? Yeah. Am I in the right place? Not yet. Where am I going, down? Six, you want 6A, you're going, you're at 10. You need to come back, come back, come back. There you go. Six, section six. There it is. Coming up, coming up, coming up. Oh, I guess not. Yeah, you're Going. Close. So close. There it is. There it is. So my question is these numbers. Is there negotiating room for that, or is that fixed, Mayor uh, or Mike or anybody or Jeff? What, Those what, are important to me. I think they're wonderful, and it's a tangible payback for the tax exemption. So I want to know if those are fixed in this agreement, or do you have room to change that? What What do you, what do you mean, room to change it, Councillor? <clears throat> Can you renegotiate 156 housing units, 97 of which are Rental units, condominiums. Yeah, I mean, the, the negotiation that talks about workforce housing and affordable housing. Are those numbers of units fixed? I, I, what, what are you What are you intimating? Are you intimating that you want to do more affordable? What, what, I, I do not want to change anything. I want to know if the agreement leaves you room <clears throat> to change those numbers. Should you reach a financial problem or something? The, 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 the only thing that might change is right now the 50 units of whether it's workforce housing or um, another housing. component, that will stay the same, okay? The difference that we may change rental units or condominium units. But those are market rate units. That's correct. Okay, that's important to me. I, I just want to know if suddenly we lose what I think is very valuable, the workforce housing, as the mayor indicated at the public hearing. Those are really important to me. Yeah, Councillor Rist, I just want to um, bring the, the committee's attention to under our 6A agreement, which is the, the agreement that we were looking at with the spreadsheet initially, um, there is language in there protecting the city with respect to those 50 units um, that if that, um, Mike does not complete them um, within a certain period of time or um, that that will be a default. Um, so the city does have that protection in those 50 workforce housing units is a, an affirmative obligation and it's um, paragraph section 13 subsection four of that agreement. So again, that's the application. If you go to the 6A agreement, which is the set, the other document. Um, Down here? Does it here? Yep. Yes. And I'm going to what, 13? Yep. So if you go down to little subsection A, 4. Yep, so you're there. And then 4. Right there. So if default means everything's off and we get taxes or whatever. Well, it means that there's a default <laughs> and either Mike, fix, Mike fixes it or something else needs to happen. <laughs> All right, I like it. Okay. The, the, the other thing, Councillor, just so you, you, know, you understand the way, you know, this contract is been, has been, is made to be able to be fluid. 
So if something changes, you know, in the world, in, in my plan, I would come back to you and the council and, and say, you know, we, you know, we would like to do this. Do you have, uh, do we have an agreement? The, the idea is to keep the dialogue open so it's not black and white. Well, yeah, and you can always renegotiate. But... Correct. Right. And I'd like to just echo, you know, Mike, what he just said, um, because, you know, as much as you can with respect to contracts, you, you know, you try to negotiate the best you can. And if something's not working or on either the city's end or the developer's end, then these contracts can be, you know, open for renegotiation if needed um, because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, who saw a pandemic coming in 2020? Um, so I, I, you know, there is that ability for the town or the city and um, Mike's company to sit down and um, discuss more if if needed. And now I saw Jeff's hand up and then Peg and then Jen. Jen. So Jeff, you had your hand up. I I just the, on this on this particular discussion, you know, in and not necessarily suggesting to keep scrolling back and forth, but on the first reference to the affordable units, I think one of the words that, you know, perhaps could be removed while we're while we're going through the final steps of this. I think, Dan, I think it was on page 17. Um, it was the same section that we were looking at, the 6A, the amenities. The, there's a word, uh, there's a word approximately before the 50 units, which I think until you get later on into the, the, the default. Right the, the, here? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, potentially removing that word approximately may be helpful for the reviewer because that's the first section that you encounter the reference to affordable units. I think it creates a question that you don't get resolved until much later in the document. Um, with that said, I, I think um, the planning board did a preliminary review of the project, um, this this proposal, and I mean, I think there there will be nothing problematic coming from the planning board in terms of whether it qualifies for the rest of the uh, criteria under 121A. Um, but I think what's important for us to know moving forward is that the 50 workforce units are one of the amenities that contribute to getting this um, alternate tax payment. So I, we, we had these discussions and they're totally, we totally appreciate it, especially in the face of a pandemic, that if something doesn't happen in the future with regard to the workforce units, it will come back to council, but it will be an important discussion that, you know, perhaps, you know, the developer could do 48 units. Of, of workforce housing. And so that's a very minor change, I think, overall, given the scope of the project, and that might still warrant the same exact schedule of payments. But if for some reason the, the units are just eliminated altogether, then I think the city has to really look at the overall project and the benefits. And I just wanted to, I was just trying to be clear that the, uh, the workforce units are an important amenity provided by the project, um, along with redeveloping you know, an extremely blighted property that's an eyesore in East Hampton, but though those units are are part of the amenity that we we established this through the early discussions. Well, it's very important to me. Hey, you got a question? Me? You had your hand up earlier. I know. I guess I'm excited. So, um, under the amenity, and this goes back to um, the low income housing again. I just have a question on continuity of the numbers. So under 6A amenities, you talk about 50 of the units will be workforce uh, or affordable housing. Then we move to section 16 under condominiums and you break out the units into rental units and, and condominiums. And then you speak about how no less than 15 apartments will be workforce and or other affordable housing. Which of these are we considering apartments, the rental units? How do we get to 50 if 15 of the 59 condominiums are going to be low income? What happens to the 97 rental? Or do the, is that where the other 35 are gonna come from? You seeing this here, everybody? That's what she's referring to. So, Oh, go ahead, Jane. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So under the statute, um, there's a section on condominiums and you it lays out specifically the ratio that you can have to um, rental apartments. And so one of them is 
25%, you can't have, you have to have a certain number, um, that 25%, you can't have more than 25%, I think. Um, so that's where that language comes in, um, that there will be no less than 15, which is that 25%. The um, 50 is still the number, but you have to put that language in there or else DHCD will, t will tick my box <laughs> and shoot my application back because it doesn't have the right language for the regulations. So, Go ahead. so just, uh, hang on. So the 15, you're just kind of putting that as a number under condominiums, but overall, including the 97 rental units, which are not condominiums, right? You can just nod your head. Anyone? No one's nodding. Um, I'm sorry, that, that'll, Mike have, will have to confirm the... Because um, there's 156 units, 59 are condominiums, 15 of the 59 will be affordable housing. By my math, that means that 35 will come from the 97 other rental units. Or is it possible that all 59 condominiums or 50 of the 59 condominiums could be low incomes, which I know is ridiculous um, and we wouldn't do that, but yeah. I'm trying to figure out how we get to 50. Is all okay, so so again, so Jane, you know, mentioned, you know, in, in the statute, that's that language under number item 16 under, you know, the, the con under condominium language. Yep. The 50 units will be apartments. Okay, so you can take that kind of however you want, you know, whether if it's 156. So in, in, our, in, our, pl in our planning board approval, um, we had to have a minimum of 75 units. Okay, so we, we are, we're hoping to have 156 units. Mm -hmm. The 156 units, 50 of them will be workforce housing right now, currently under um, as, as rentals under the way the program is working right now. The problem that, the reason why we had to keep it open like that is under a gateway city program, we could allow condominiums with by, by right of deed as an affordable component. But because the city of East Hampton is not a gateway city, we couldn't, we couldn't use a condominium. Does that make sense? I think so. So the 15, but you will have 15 of the condominiums to be workforce and or affordable housing. No, no we're going to have, no. gonna have 50, 50, 50 rental units will be, will be some sort of affordable component, whether it's workforce housing or a combination of workforce housing. So I'm just going to um, just clarify because I think some clarity <laughs> is needed because it's a little confusing. So under the statute, there's a there's a section 18D and it's on condominiums. And it says that if you, if developer is going to elect to have condominiums in its project, then it can have no more than 50% total. So you could have 50% rental apartments or rentals, whatever, and then 50% condos. So here, why we had to break it out um, about the 62 and the 37 is we're showing, hey, no, we're not gonna have more than 50% condos. So that was the, under that section of the statute, it's 18D under condominiums, it says that you need to have no more than 50 condominiums. So that's the first, um, sentence. So then the second part of that statute, um, that, that um, section, excuse me, of the statute so, so states that um, the housing board, which in this por portion is DHCD or the planning board, um, shall require that uh, if you're going to do condominiums, then you have to make sure that 25% of your rental housing, so two different things, so you're moving into rentals now, but if you're gonna have condos, then at least 25% of your rentals need to be for um, workforce affordable housing. Um, so it's just saying, you don't have to have any affordable housing under the statute if you don't want to, you could have completely market rate housing. But they are saying, if you are going to elect to have condominiums, as a component of your project, and again, you don't have to have condos, but if you do elect to have condos, then 
at least 25% of your residential apartment rentals needs to be affordable. So that's where no less than 15, which will be the 25% of that 59, um, will be um, rentals. I mean, affordable, sorry. So can I state it a different way? Yes. <laughs> you, you may or may not have condominiums, but if you do have condominiums, you have to have at least 15 affordable housing units and the rest would be out of the regular rental units. Am I correct? It says no yes. less than 15 apartments will be. So I'm assuming if you have condominiums, then this statute kicks in. Yes. And then that section kicks in, correct. But bottom line is there's always going to be 50 affordable workforce housing units, whether they're all rental or some of them are condominium. Condominium. Bottom line, bottom line um, Mike's company is agreeing that there's going to be 50 units of workforce or other affordable housing. How he gets there, I don't know. But um, what his intent is, is, I think, to have all those be rentals. Peg, does that help answer your question? <laughs> Yes, I, it, it's just my only comment is I love lawyers, um, but, and I'm related to a lot of them, so I can say that. But why would you suddenly throw in the word apartment when nowhere in here has the word apartment been used? We've been talking about housing units, rental units, and condominiums, and then we start talking about no, uh, apartments, and that's what is confusing me. Are condominiums rentable and they're not apartments or it's not worth going into as long as we get 50 units i'm good i don't frankly care where they come from i will cede my time <laughs> i think that the the difference in the language um went from because condos are an ownership type of right. um ho housing right. um you own that and then apartments are rental so i don't think that it was an intentional um you know, change. Um, but, you know, I think if you're going to do, if you would, if the um, council is more comfortable with adding rental, it's um, probably, it's probably rental me. units, I think that's fine. Let me say this. If our city attorney and our treasurer and our mayor understand this, it's okay with me. My bottom line is the same as Peg's 50 units. Okay. That's the bottom line. Jen, I saw your hand up, but then I'm going to go to Tom. Erica's had hers up for a long time, Dan. Oh, you know why? Because I don't have her picture here. Yeah. Uh, Been up for a while. Erica, you're next then. Thank you. Can um, I'm, I'm in agreement with the 50 units, so thank you for, I was kind of, hand was up and down as I was trying to figure that out. But can I also just, and I, I know I had this document open myself before, and I do remember there were some definitions, I believe, on, can we just get a little clarity on what is workforce versus affordable and why is it always broken up that way? Um, that is something that I'm interested in knowing the difference between workforce housing and affordable housing in those 50 units. So affordable housing is just a, the general term for any type of um, income limited housing, right? So when you're talking about specifically workforce housing, you're talking about a specific percentage of the income um, ratio for the city of East Hampton. So under the, these are state um, mandated guidelines. Um, under the state workforce is essentially, you're looking at 80% of the average um, income in the city of East Hampton. So someone cannot, um, that level is 80%. It's not um, low income, it's not section eight, it's nothing like that. It's um, that 80% of the, the income, which I think um, we talked about Jeff Bag at the, um, planning board meeting, I think we did, um, about, you know, what that average would probably be and that you're looking at, you know, I don't know, like 60,000 or something like that per year of salary um, to qualify for workforce. So affordable is just kind of the general, you know, overall definition of any type of income limited housing. So just to the second part of that question then is, do we have, is there a breakdown of the low income housing because 
I just see in our most recent draft of the housing production plan, there is a need for housing for folks that are below what you're describing as that workforce level, um, and specifically families. There's a lot of one and two bedroom housing housing opportunities here, but for the low income, we do have a high need. And is there any way to address and gain a little bit of commitment from these 50 units? Has that been discussed? And is that something um, that can be planned for to meet those needs within these 50 units? Right. Like, what is the breakdown between uh, workforce and, and affordable low income? Mike, you want to answer that? Yep. Yep. So, um, Councilor, if I, I I would love to be able to do you know that lower tier of affordability, um, but there's no subsidy right now. The city of East Hampton, from what we've gathered right now, there aren't. It, it doesn't. It doesn't work. So we I can't afford to put in that type of housing unless there's some sort of subsidy, whether it's from the city or from the state. And right now, I don't. We don't see that anywhere. Jeff, I think I think what would be helpful to help um, further answer Councillor Flood's question is: um, Is there a way that you can help us understand if if it is um, just workforce units? So workforce is like a capital W term, and it's a program through Mass Housing at the state. So. Um, is there a way to give us an understanding of what the 50 units would look like if it was just workforce um, in terms of the sliding scale of income? How many units? Because my understanding is, um, you know, as Jane was saying, um, affordable with a with a capital A. So, so to be defined as affordable, it has to be 80% of the area mean income or lower. Um, but my understanding is that if if you're looking at 80%, um, and you're looking at 50 workforce units, there's, so, there's a sliding scale and some number of units are at, at 80%. So some would, be, some would qualify as capital A affordable units and then the rest would be above that going up to 120% of the area mean income. So I think for moving forward in the discussion, um, it could be good for us to understand what is 50 units of workforce look like because that may be the, the that may be the that may be what we end up with. That may be the minimum we can get out of the project. Um, and then I think the developer has said or affordable units, which would be a wider range of lower income eligibility. But it sounded like from Mr. Michon's response that that, that may not be what um, ultimately happens. So I think for us to move forward, it might be good for us to understand what the 50 units under the workforce pros program looks like, um, so that we're all at least starting from the same page. Uh, so, Mike, I don't know if that's possible. From what yeah, no, it, it isn't. It isn't, Jeff. I, I can't. I can't commit to that. What, what I'm committing to is 50 units, whether it's a workforce housing or some other um, subsidy that's involved, and that's all I can do right now. Because the problem is when you get into work, even the workforce housing units, which I'm, you know, I've been in dialogue with Mass Housing for the last three years. It's, it's, it's very complicated, and, and what it does is a lot of times the, the math doesn't pencil. And I have to be careful in order for this project to be successful for all of us here to be able to take bits and pieces of this and spread this out over the entire six buildings on the, on, of, the, of, the, of the project or, or of the last handful of buildings. Um, so I, I can't commit because... First of all, we you know we don't even know what's going to happen next year. Maybe this maybe there'll be some more benefit here, which would be great. Um, but if there isn't, then you know we have to we have to reexamine that. Uh, I have one last follow. Up? Erica, Sorry, follow -up. just uh, it's my and this is maybe for Jeff. Is Jeff does the workforce housing get us? Does it move us in a positive direction for our housing stock, the low income housing stock? Does that move the needle? Um, it should. Um, I guess you know the way the way Mr. Michon just explained it was a little bit unclear for me. Which is if there's, I guess if the, if there's any way to understand what 
You've had discussions with Mass Housing on sure, for, the, sure. for the 50, you, you, just to understand the income sure. levels that have me, been. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let me, let me, can you, um, can you put, take the screen down with this so we can. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so Jeff, so how it works is there's, you know, there's 80% of AMI with, with a, with a scale um, on, on, depending on how many units we're going to have, there's 90% and then there's a hundred percent. The issue with the 80% is, is the 80% units. We have to subsidize all the utilities for these tenants. So let's say for instance, a market rate unit at 80%, a market rate unit, we could get $1,800 a month. I'm just going to throw a number out there. The 80% of AMI restricts us to $1,300 a month for that unit. And then on top of that, we have to pay for the utilities. So we can't afford to have a lot of 80% of the AMI units. We need the 90 to the 100 to the 110% of the units which are still below market rate in order for this to, to work. So the 50% threshold, I mean, the 50 units that you know, is in this agreement really pushes the envelope for this project. So to, to answer your question, unless we can get a LIHTC partner in that would come in with lower income housing tax credits and be involved, we, we just, we can't, I cannot go over 50. And like I said, 50 is a, is a long reach as it is, even with the, the 80, 90, 100, 110% scale for this project. Yeah, for, for, that was helpful actually to understand that part of it. And in terms of the difficulty going over a total number of 50. So I think that that made sense. Um, with mass housing, though, to enter into their workforce housing program and be eligible for the for what for the, for what they're providing you, are they requiring any number of eighty percent units? They are. So, so you know, actually, as of today, you know, they're 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 what they're looking to do is is building five, which is the next building we're going to build on. It will be coming online, and I haven't finalized this yet, but they're looking to have nine units at 80% of the 43, but that doesn't pencil right now because what the, the problem with mass housing is mass housing takes the permanent financing for the project. So we'll have a construction lender supply us with financing to build the, build the units. Then we have mass housing comes in and they'll take nine units with, uh, uh, with their program and then they'll take the permanent financing for the balance of the building. And right now, their, their math isn't working because they're in the four, four and a half percent interest range when I can go to HUD and get HUD financing at 2.75. So that, that's the issue that we're running up against right now. So I have to get through that somehow. I've been in touch with DHCD. I was in touch with them last week and as well as today. And they're going to get back to me with some sort of alternate program, if possible. So to answer your question, I can't answer your question. All I can do is say is there's going to be 50 units and how it's going to play into the mix. I honestly don't know. Just to, just to get an overview here, the contract says there must be 50 units of workforce housing and or affordable units. Workforce housing is income limited. Uh, housing in the sense that it could be 90 to 100 110 percent um and affordable housing goes down to 80 but how many of each type is in flux but you will give us 50 eventually I, that that's the that's the that's the question that i can't answer you you can't answer which types but you can give us 50. that's correct okay yeah and then just to try to put a cap on the idea of what um uh, Councilor Flood was asking is if it, and it doesn't sound like this is set in stone in any way, but if if there was a way for the developer to, to provide nine units at the 80% threshold, that's the that's the threshold that is critical for us achieving 
goals for affordable housing. That's the, that's the only number that DHCD is going to look at for us achieving affordable housing goals is any units that are 80% or lower. Um, that said, the, the, you know, the units at values at 90 or 100 or 110 will still be more affordable than a regular market rate unit. But um, it, I'm, hope, I'm trying to answer your question really hard, uh, Ms. Flood, is that the 80% number is the really important one in terms of affordable housing. You know, and, and this isn't necessarily to suggest this project, but the report, the production plan that we have coming out in draft is really showing that we need, we need the very low income uh, units as well. So we need, we need a whole bunch of units that are 80% and lower. But for the purposes of this discussion, what would what would really count for East Hampton's goals for affordable is is those at 80%. Um, those are the ones that count for our SHI, our standard house, housing inventory. So hopefully I answered it um, to some extent. It's not abundantly clear which numbers we're going to get or council risk question about what, what numbers do we expect to see go up, um, what types of units, but... That's about it for me at this point. Um, just before, before you, Mayor, I saw Tom Peake's answer, and then yep. you. The mayor had her hand up first. No, you were up earlier. All right, he concedes to you, Mayor. Um, it, you know, to Councillor Flood's um, question and wondering about low income and lower income housing uh, for the last year, maybe longer. We've approached many of the low income housing uh, contractors or uh, the folks uh, who manage those apartments, like the lottery, the apart, you know, meeting all the federal and state requirements. Um, what they have told us very candidly is that they they need a certain number of units to to make it feasible. And that we've been told different things over the last, I don't know, let's say year from 40 to 70. Um, and one of the types of projects that we're really interested and think can support is um, interesting and, and that we can support and need is about 40 right now in one location. And, and Jeff actually tried to get a piece of property that a, a resident wanted to sell for affordable housing. And excuse me, um, it didn't pass the mustard for conservation stuff and buffers. It, you know, for what we, we, we came so close um, that said, what what is changing um, now, and, and maybe it's because lending money is, is much cheaper, um, that two of the biggest agencies, both Valley CDC and Wayfinders, are really interested, and we've had a couple of conversations, in doing lower income housing in East Hampton, and maybe using existing buildings or whatnot. So... Um, I feel good about that um, because they approached us rather than the other way around. Um, I, I also will uh, uh, say uh, around that and, and ditto what the planner said, it was surprising to me in the housing needs and production plan, how many units we needed across the continuum to especially um, I don't want to normalize or or help us with that higher tax rate and values. Um, and I, I didn't expect that. I, I thought it would be more um, lower income veterans and family rental units with two and three bedrooms because it's very hard to find it. Um, as So when it came back with workforce initiative housing and even market rate, and especially first time home um, uh, buyer houses, that, it, it surprised me. So it gives us new direction um, and also gives us the opportunity to show the community supports and has spent time 
and money on a production plan that's showing us um, that low income and first time home buyer uh, program. If that was very long, but I, I just kind of wanted to give you a, a past preview of what we've worked very hard on and going forward, what we're focusing on in large part because of that housing needs and production plan. It gives us some backup when we go to developers and also the state. So sorry for the seven minute um, explanation. I hope it was helpful. Um, I get it. I just want everybody who's getting excited about 50 units to understand what these 50 units are. And I'm not trying to be brash, but no, I, 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 I do. I'm very excited yeah. about this development. I've lived down the street from it my entire existence. It's beautiful, right. but it's yeah. also for the taxpayers to get the most bang for their dollar. There's a high need for affordable housing and yeah. you're going to put something brand new and shiny in a, in a neighborhood where people are really struggling. So mm -hmm. I just wanna make sure that as a neighbor that I'm calling that out. And if maybe, if you yeah. need 40 units and you have a clean slate over there, maybe there's an opportunity for further discussion down the road to find those 40 units with other partners as well. And I'm gonna have to raise that flag every time because you can't put a sparkling tower in the middle of this neighborhood without consideration of what it does you know that's it's really tough um so i get the challenges financially it keeps coming up there's no money in helping people but we have to find a way to help people because it keeps coming up in our housing production plans it was in the last one too so i mike i love what you've done your team it's amazing uh and i'm kind of saying try harder but i know you've worked your tail off on it too so i just want to i just have to put it out there it's my job and i thank you for everything you have done and for that explanation uh mayor and also uh from planner bag thanks for all that info understood and and Absolutely agree, Councillor Flood. Absolutely. But I, I understand and, and I hear you. Tom P. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly, that when we're talking about like affordable, like workforce housing, like what that actually means is people in the 80 to 120 percent of the median income. So basically average East Hampton people. We're talking about like the average range of East Hampton people. And we're actually talking about prices around $1,300 for a rental unit with subsidized rent. Like, I, no, I, there's, am I getting that I, right, Jeff? Sorry, council. I, I just, I just throw that number out there. I, you know, I don't, mm -hmm. there is a scale, you know, the scale is whether it's a studio, the, 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 the studio would be X, a one bedroom would be X, a two bedroom would be X sure. in that price range. But, but yes, to answer your question, it is, you know, $68,000 is the average, you know, of this area. And then if you take, you know, 80% of that, it's about 54. Um, and then plus what we have to do is we have to pay for, on top of that, we have to pay for. I lost your mic. Did I lose some of that? I don't yeah, know. Your audio cut out, cut out for a second. Mike, your audio cut out at the very end, man. Okay, let me, let me, so. You're fine now. Did you, what did you? Yeah, uh, I get what you were, you were saying that you have to pay for the utilities, right? The word utilities, I think, cut out. Correct. Okay. Hey, uh, Jeff, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions about this? I just, like, I guess my question now, and before this, I should just say that this is a blighted property, right? And any redevelopment on it is like inherently probably a good thing just in that. But just for the purpose of, of, of all of this, like, is there something a little bit perverse about a situation where average East Hampton people getting rents that they could like, like median income people is seen as like a public good? Because doesn't that sort of inherently acknowledge that median income East Hampton people can't afford to live here? Like, isn't this whole thing kind of insane? Like, not 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 the project, and I'm, I mean no offense to to anyone who's working on the project, but the whole idea that we're talking about this as a public, that it's some sort of inherent public good to, pro to provide housing that median income people in our city can afford, that just seems like a hilariously low bar to talk about like it's this 
like deep public good that inherently requires subsidization. I mean, I'm, I'm not like, again, I think this project is great one way or another. It's just sort of disturbing to me the way that we're even talking about this. I think it's a challenging question that you just asked. And I don't know if I, and I don't want to dance around it too, too much, but I think if you take one step back and look at kind of our zoning overall, the, the, the perversion I think that you're kind of touching on is that we nowhere do we require a project to have affordable housing. So we, we, the, 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 the terminology, if, if you're a planner, the terminology would be inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. So many communities in Massachusetts have tried to pass inclusionary zoning, which is just a blanket requirement that some percentage of any housing built is affordable. And we don't have inclusionary zoning. So our zoning does not start with a requirement that a development have affordable housing. So that's, I think that's the perversion that you're touching on is that where we're at now is any, um, any developer who's willing to provide any level of affordable housing is, is offering something um, to the community. And so what we're being asked is to balance out the tax, you know, the alternative tax payment with the overall development of the property, which is very important for East Hampton. And I think the question here is whether the addition of a workforce units are of value enough, you know, to, to also make that incentive worth it uh, for the city. I would argue that it is because if, if we do not get the workforce housing units as part of this negotiation, then we will get none. Um, and there so, won't be a single unit that a normal person in East Hampton can afford. That may be. I um, well, the word Unless normal. We the word this. normal. The word normal is the one that you caught me on that one. I, I, I'm. It's a strong way of saying median it, but, income. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a that's probably the more technical way. But as of right now, I guess the baseline is that this development to occur does not require any affordable units. So it is now this question of adding the workforce units, it, it is something, and it is something that we would not normally get um, without this discussion of the 121A before us. So it's a little bit of grappling with is, is this, uh, and it is important because it will offer the opportunity for 50 house, you know, 50 people to potentially live there. Um, it depends on the scale. I think a little bit more clarity on the scale of what mass, the mass housing program looks for you know, it might be helpful um, from the developer to to help us understand what exactly are we going to expect in the 50 units. Um, so I agree, but um, Councillor Peak, does that answer it though? I think we start from this place where affordable housing units are not required. So, so mm -hmm. we're starting from that awkward place, which is that then any development that we get, you know, is is the developer the developer is offering these additional units um and they often that's that's the need is they need to be whole on the other side um to do that that's that's a that's the discussion about changing zoning you know, do we require affordable units or do we make it easier for us to get developments that incorporate them and that's, that's a big discussion that comes out of the housing production plan well, Jeff, you know that I'm definitely always happy to talk zoning with you. Um, you know, it's been a big thing that I've been wanting to work on for a while now. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I get this and I understand the financing behind it and I'm not making any accusations against anyone. I just think that the way that we talk about this, we need to be a little bit sensitive to the fact that I think when most people hear affordable, they don't think average income for a person who lives in the city. Um, they probably don't think 80% of average income for a person who lives in the city either. So I just think that that's an interesting thing. I mean, I know, yeah, all right. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna get anywhere by pressing this point. Um, I, I have just one more question and I hope it, I, I wonder if it's, I hope it's not too, too far off, um, but I do kind of wonder um, it, when you hear about these sort of uh, luxury developments going in elsewhere in Massachusetts, one thing, um, that I hear a lot about is sort of overseas buyers purchasing these units as um, like 
investment properties, but then not actually occupying them. You hear about that a lot in like, you know, these luxury condos in the Boston area where half the units are actually empty and they're just somewhere for like some oligarch to stash their cash. Is that something that we are at all worried about here? Mike. <laughs> I don't know who can answer that. <laughs> I, it's it's a good question. So I, I don't I don't have an answer for you. You know I, I don't. Uh, you know I've been a developer for thirty five years, and I, I haven't. I I don't want to want to say if I should say fortunately or unfortunately. I have not had that happen. All right, maybe this market isn't quite like that. It's just something I heard about, and I felt I needed to ask. Thank you. I have a a comment, and then a question for Jeff. I looked at this project as as improving a very blighted area that's been blighted for decades. And the affordable slash workforce housing component was an added benefit. I didn't look at this as a housing project for certain income levels. And I always looked at it as something that came with the project, which is very welcome. Also, we're not getting any taxes from this project. And if we don't provide this alternate tax, system schedule, the project may not happen, probably wouldn't happen. And the blight continues. And the fact that the development of this project will also bring in economic development to the city, the people living there will spend money in our city, et cetera. Um, those benefits have to be realized. So I just want to say that the fact that there's workforce housing is to me a great icing on the cake, but it's not a deal breaker if, if you, you didn't have them in the original contract maybe we could have asked for them but i'm very glad that you're doing that i just want to say that i do have a comment a, a question um on the diff jeff which is paying for future infrastructure improvements we just paved ferry street what is that referring to are we going to be digging that up and building and doing more infrastructure improvement no, um, you know, along the way, we we sort of bifurcated the overall grand, the, the larger scope of the project. We split it into two parts. Um, part one is is nearing completion, and that's the Mass Works grant. That's all the road infrastructure work. There was a retaining wall built, you know, and all the, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about what that project provides, including the walkway in front of the pond. Um, the other part of the project, and I will just seek confirmation, we haven't talked about it in a while, but um, as you go up Ferry Street and are leaving the Mass Works portion, you cross the canal bridge and you're going up and, phase, and on the left side, on the project side is, you know, kind of described as phase two um, on the east side of the canal. You know, the developer has plans to um, reconfigure and create three buildings with surface parking. And then there is a piece, there's a couple critical pieces of infrastructure, which is another retaining wall. Um, in some utility work. And then the on top of the retaining wall is where the proposal is to create a, an additional bike path connection um, from Ferry Street to, to the bike path. And it'll be, it's closer to the Parsons Street area. And so as we look at reconfiguring the Parsons Street, Ferry Street intersection that will be upgraded and it will link to the, the diff funded portion, which is the, the, the bike path connector um, that was, that was our, you know, discussion of the, the final pieces of the public infrastructure. So the retaining wall construction helps the development continue to proceed. Um, so it's a critical piece of infrastructure, but on top of it, the public benefit that we get is the bike path connector. Um, and I think there was, there's some additional, you know, public parking that gets, um, associated with the retaining wall construction. So that was my we haven't talked about it in a while, but that's the that's the conversations that have happened with around the diff. That was what um, yes, I, I don't know if the developer or, or Jeff Daly have. I was just worried that work we already did was going to be dug up, and that's not the case. No, it's all in addition to the work done. Hey guys, saw your hand up. Yeah, I, I, just because I can never leave a discussion without leaving some commentary. Um, when this first came to us. Um, certainly having that whole area built up and usable 
and having commerce in there and making money for the city to some degree is all great. I think driving past there, it's going to be beautiful. What's happening with the rotary and the street and the promenade and all that is all good. But there was a certain level of excitement and interest that was portrayed to me and others that there would be affordable housing. And now that we've kind of dug into it a little bit and talked about it, it's very disappointing. Like, I think we need to stop talking about it as like, oh, and by the way, we're going to get affordable housing because we're really not. Tom's right. Nobody in East Hampton is going to be able to afford these regardless of what we call them. So to start touting this as, isn't this great? And it's all wonderful. And I love it. I, like, I'm very excited for it. But to then tack on this added bonus of, and we're going to have affordable housing, I think it's a little disingenuous and I don't think, I think it makes us all feel like we're doing something good, but I don't know that we are. So I don't know that we necessarily should lead with that when we're talking about this. Let's just call it what it is. Maybe some people will get a little discount on the rent, but overall, you know, it just doesn't seem like a feather in our cap. I was thinking it was going to be more to what Erica was talking about. If it's not that, then I just, you know, as a marketing ploy, it doesn't feel like something that we need to be talking about as this awesome thing. I mean, it, I don't know. That's just, I'm kind of with you, Tom. It just feels a little icky, but. Mayor, Mayor Nicole. Um, so to that point, um, I feel at least from what I said, uh, over the course is affordable housing with this project. And, and I remember Jeff saying this as well is small a affordable housing and Jana Tatro brought that up as the affordable housing partnership that yes, it's more affordable than, you know, market rate, but, and there are capital a affordable housing um, units, but I don't feel that we put forward that the, the 50 units or the, you know, 60 units or, or as the numbers change, you know, said it was affordable capital A. Um, and I just think of the people, including myself, who talked to that point. I mean, I know that this has been a long time, but I remember talking about the small a affordable units specifically not counting as a part of that 10%, um, you know, and, and not to, to pick a bone, but, but that's, you know, I, I like leading or not leading, I'm fine to explain that over and over again, especially the effort I've been I've put in to getting capital A affordable housing and my frustration with people who develop this, like Wayfinders, they're interested in having something in East Hampton and the numbers for them, for them don't work because, you know, per square foot, capital A affordable housing is is bigger, it, it, it's more, mm -hmm. and they need a certain number of units to, to make it happen. Um, and we have now tried, I, I just, we have tried with the Everett Street property, we have tried with the house we just auctioned, we have tried reusing buildings we have, or, or even looking at the old schools prematurely, and we have been told the numbers aren't there. They, we are being told, go look at live 155 with those number to make that. Do I think that will change soon? I feel pretty good about it because you're seeing first time home buyer programs bump from $4,000 down payment to 15. And, and I see the need and production plan um, as far as the $1,300 a month rent, when I talk to realtors and I freak out about that, that's the going rate for two and three family apartments. And it makes me very upset, 
And I said, well, that must be for new people moving into town. And I am told no when I talk to rental agents. That's, that's a reality. Um, and maybe it has to do with higher taxes. But, but I am going to defend that point as well at city council. Like, we have a problem, and we have it with HUD. And this, this idea, and, and, you know, Mike could probably talk to that, the square footage of building affordable capital A housing because of a, a good reasons is much higher. I would, I would also remind people, and I was on the zoning board, that for Treehouse, the reason why Judy and community builders were interested is one, the number of units, but also remember, Judy sold and financed that treehouse project with market rate houses on Button Road and including some, and, and she leveraged that market rate housing houses to be able to offset the, the building of affordable capital A affordable housing like yeah i mean you're building you know 50 to 70 units in northampton and like the two lumber yard and live 155 i'm i'm hoping with reuse we can do a similar project because we can get those number of units on on the schools or other property that might come uh, available um yeah so I, that's my piece. Erica. I'm sorry if I'm a little confused, but I hear Mike saying he needs somebody who can come in with low income housing tax credits. And you're saying you have developers who have them. And I'm looking at a blighted lot that has nothing built. So why are we not putting, I mean, am I, am I missing something? Like, can Mike not work with Valley CDC and Wayfinders to build those units on this vast vacant lot this is where i'm confused because yep. this is our opportunity this is our blank slate we are offering tax breaks to make this happen and you're telling me player a and player b can't play together that's what i'm hearing i don't get it i just don't get it so I'm, yeah what what's so, the problem where's the disconnect the disconnect actually is in how low income housing tax credits are used by wayfinders valley cdc community builders and beacon properties for them to get ready to do a project like this they can only have one big project in the shoot with the state and federal government right now all of them while they're interested in doing something in east hampton we're talking about a project that is years in advance. So for instance, and I just forgot, Wayfinder, I think it's Wayfinders, or Valley CDC, has a huge project going into South Hadley. And, and that is in the chute, and they will use their tax credits for that. Tax credits are allocated annually. So when we got the tax credits for new market tax for Valley, um, River Valley Market, it was a push because the Northeast was not, we didn't get tax credits, enough tax credits for food, community food-based uh, projects. And, and we had to negotiate as far away as Chicago. The tax credits for low income work the same way. People get an allotment, these agencies get an allotment for an annual um, year they apply them to projects that really started anywhere from two to three years before. And then there's a holding project. There's a holding because they can only have one big project in the shoot with uh, the Department of Economic Development and Community. It's, it's just a really complex process and, and it's, a, it's a lot of waiting. And, and I would just say on Mike's part, we had to negotiate this like the day I took office as mayor and starting that. And so to leverage, leverage public dollars for private financing. And at that point, and, and still people want to work with East Hampton, but 
I've got to find space for more than or equal to 40 units. And we don't have the real estate right now to do that. It's on Ferry Street and it seems to be a 25 year project. I'm just, don't, I can't, I, I don't want to hijack the meeting. I'm just saying, I think yeah. it seems like this is going to take a long time to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and we have a blank slate. So I'm, well, I think, yeah, one of the, again, one Mike, of the, I, I, I would just disagree. The, the applicant here has said he has $22 million in financing and it doesn't, it's not for low income um, tax credits. So two years ago, when I took office, all of these major players in Western Mass and some from Boston already had two and three big, like Life 155, the Lumber Yard, the project in South Hadley, that was already in their chute. So now they're going forward with those projects and we need to get in line with that. So, and, and One Ferry Street is not a 25 year project. It, it's hopefully, it, you know, we were hoping five years with the pandemic, maybe it's seven. Like, while it's just starting, it's actually planned out. And, and it had to be the MassWorks application that we submitted in 2017 already had to describe the project this was going to be for the developer because we needed to show we would leverage our public dollars so he could get financing. And, and that was in place, like one ferry street and whatnot, that, that was in place, you know, I, I don't, like that started six months after we submitted the MassWorks. I mean, I, and I understand, I just want to be, as the public watches this, it is, I find it imperative because we are asking this committee and city council to indeed do what's in front of you, which is alter what would normally be a tax, like a tax bill to, to giving, you know, to exchanging a developed lighted property to a developer so it works for his financing. And, and it's, you know, the, the timing of it is, you know, we try, you know, I can't even say we tried our best. We tried our best not for affordable housing with a capital A, we tried our best with very blighted property that had complex situations and we couldn't make the dollars work. And, and if Wayfinders came in and said, we wanna do one Ferry Street and that they had to tear down a building, we would, for the buildings that are most developable, we have historical issues. All right. I um, I'd like to move so on. I'm sorry. I just want to be clear that the public doesn't think this is a bait and switch. That's all. I have something. Uh, can I? The housing component. But Jeff, I'll give you a couple of minutes to respond. But I, I'd like to make sure that we're there is a bottom line here. Do we want to give this developer the alternate schedule to improve a blighted project? That's our primary. Um, task in front of us. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, I guess I want to try to parallel something that the mayor's saying and, and kind of just try, I'm trying to respond to Councillor Flood's question, which I think is a fair question. Um, but I am not a housing developer. I'm not, I'm not an expert in financing, but I, there's a couple things that I am trying to formulate I'm trying to figure out to help understand that there is a disconnect. I think you asked if there was a disconnect and I do think there is um, because when you look at a project that's 100% affordable units or even a deep number of affordable units, it's, it's funded, um, applied for and developed by that entity. So if you take Wayfinders, you know, they come in and they acquire or lease a property and then they, they go through the full development process and seek all the funding. They do it all kind of one shop, they're in-house. So this is different because I, I, do, I, don't, I don't think we have a clean slate. We are not in a position to require that or get it, all that units. Um, the developer needs a subsidy to fill in a gap, the gap between 80 and 100%. And those, the, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to walk through this because the entities that, you, that we described 
or that the mayor was even talking about, they don't come in to just fill those gaps. It's like not enough of a project for them to become involved with. So it is a gap that the developer has to find another way to fill um, that those agencies won't do it. It's not a project that they'll just jump on and they'll just develop the 40 units. They, they have to own it. Um, they have to own the portion of the property or the building. And that's the conversation that we've had. The mayor was referring to is we've tried to show people, show those companies, you know, some properties and say, would this work? Or like, could we develop affordable housing here? And the one on Everett street is an example where they just said, no, we're never going to get enough units to um, jump on the property, begin all the due diligence and take it and develop it and own it. And so that the difference is that we have a private developer who is trying to provide some of the units. We don't have the full involvement of, you know, affordable housing developer. Um, that's, I just, I'm just trying, cause I, you know, it's important that there is a disconnect. It's not, a, it's not just putting the two parties together and saying work together. Um, they're, they're pretty disconnected. Uh, something that Councilor Conniff said, you know, I'm a little sensitive about, which is understanding the perception or the portrayal of this. You know, I put out a lot of videos on Facebook about the infrastructure project. I, I have not talked a lot publicly about the private development and the housing types because it's been unclear. So I just, I just want to try to take a step back from having from 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 the planner or even maybe the mayor promoting that this is big affordable units coming in. Um, I'm just sensitive to that and the perception of that. What I, uh, what I wanted to try to end on is a little bit more where Councilor Riss just described this as the icing on the cake. So this is something above and beyond. It, it is still something that we, um, that we will get um, and it is beneficial. I, I, the only things I really take issue with is that, you know, no one in East Hampton would be able to afford these. And, and, the, and there was something that Councilor Peak said that I, I think we really need to look at what these numbers mean, the incomes and the types of jobs that people would have that would qualify for the workforce units. It's not, this is not unattainable. This is not, um, it's not nothing. I mean, I just want to, and, and we don't have the data. And so, so maybe the developer and his team can un help us understand what do those sliding scales look like? What does 90, 100, or 100% of the median, median income, what does that look like for wages? Um, that might help us realize that we're not talking about, you know, we're still talking about below market rate. So I think that's just important to just make sure that we have clarity that we're still getting something that is not required as, as part of the conversation in, in addition to the full redevelopment of property. So. That, that I just wanted to try to capture those thoughts. Councilor Khan? Yeah, I just want to be really clear. My comments in no way are a criticism for you, the mayor, or anybody who's worked on this. I think this is phenomenal that you've gotten it to where you've gotten it to and that we're going to eventually cross the finish line. So I, I apologize if you took it as a criticism because it's not meant that way. I'm looking at it in terms of just the public view of the word affordable housing is a very different definition than this conversation has kind of illuminated. And so all I'm saying is let's just be careful and call it what it is and be very clear about that. But no, I, and I apologize if it came off as being critical or criticism of the two of you or anyone working on this, because I, I can't even imagine the number of hours that have gone into it. And I think you've all done a great job. So I apologize. I'd like to, Dan, I think you want to make a motion. <laughs> no, I'd like to find out, number one, Jeff is alluding to some kind of, I don't know, a sliding scale document or some kind of work on uh, workforce housing numbers, et cetera, Mike. Uh, it's not something that I feel we need. It's not a major component of this. The major component is the tax exemption we are giving so that a blighted area can be done. That's the big deal. Uh, it's always been for me that workforce housing is great. Um, but can you provide what Jeff is talking about? Are you clear on what Jeff is talking about? Is that something you're willing to do? I'm not saying it's a deal breaker at all. It's just I'm not a counselor. I, I, I would be, you know, I would be, I, I want to be, I'm transparent and I would be uncomfortable with that because I don't know 
what that does with, you know, with the overall project, not knowing what we have coming down the line over the next couple of years. Uh, I, 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 I just, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable with it. Well, I, as I said, I don't need it. Do the finance committee members need something like that? Because I'm prepared to move on this. I think it's a bigger discussion that is not relevant to the motion of whether we want to, you know, recommend this 121A. And it goes to what Tom was saying and Jeff about inclusionary zoning and all of that. That has to be it's bigger. shot. It's bigger. Yeah, that's a big issue. Yeah. Including Erica's points, they are very big issues, but it's not pertinent to what we're voting on. Uh, as I understand this, Jeff, we vote on this. Let's say we agree to the application and the agreement tonight. Then when it goes to city council, hopefully by the 16th, the city council approves what the finance committee recommends and also approves what the planning board recommends. Am I correct on that, Mayor and Jeff, the process here? When the planning board gives us a report, does the city council have to approve that report and approve this financing agreement? Is it two things? Yeah. You know, and I will, my understanding of it is that the, the planning board will issue a report um, which goes through the required findings under 121A, and they, they started that. Um, they're continuing that tomorrow night. Um, then that will be used by the full city council. You know, it looks like what other communities did is the city council chose to adopt the findings of the planning board as as findings for that for the for the for issuing the 121A. I think in this case, you have the you have the the blighted condition findings and, and the findings that the planning board had made, and then you have the recommendation of this committee or the input from this committee, and then the city council takes both of those and that and uses those two, um, you know, those two pieces of information to to vote whether or not to um, grant the authority to the mayor to, to enter into the agreement as, you know, as written or as amended. So it's information from planning, information from finance committee, one motion to approve the 129 you know, and give the mayor authority to conclude it, it sounds like. Well, you can, you can catch us up on that, maybe you and the legal team or whatever. I just want to make sure we vote. Tonight, we're voting on finance committee. I think we're voting on agreeing to the, the 121A agreement as pertains to the financing, the tax exemption schedule as presented. Am I correct? Is that something that we should vote on? I think that's the way we're voting. And the only thing that I heard was that there is a slightly revised chart uh, with the push down of the first year. So, and I, I did try to fish through my emails. I, I think I have it and I think Jen has it, but I don't think, I think that came after the original transmittal. So I think with that one amendment, you're correct. I think that that's the, that's the motion. I think the full council will need that. I think we can move knowing that's coming. I don't know. How do you feel about that, Peg and Omar? Well, um, Jen, uh, Jen, and I, th I know you've had your hand up 457 times, but Jen did mm -hmm. send me a message that the net impact of that first couple of years of property values is $37,000 over the life of the 30, 25 years, however many it is. So over 5.2 million, we now have to back off 37,000 for the big, the total number. So is that correct, Jen? She's just nodding her head. Yes. All right, well, I do want us to get the city council to get that final schedule with the amended version. Yeah, and uh, Jeff, I did, um, while we were going through the meeting, I did find the spreadsheet. I just hadn't saved it in the folder. It was still in my email. Um, so I, uh, Councillor Riss, do you want me to send that to you and Peg? Sure. Well, no. Um, so or, full no. Council. Full council. Full council. Full council. Okay. Because that's going to be pertinent to the public hearing. Right. Got it. Okay. Hey, Dan? Yeah? The calendar that was in the packet um, has us has the 45 days for the planning board on December 19th. That's the end date for when we got to get the report from them. And then we had set a February 2nd date 
for city council's final recommendation, I suppose, to the mayor, because that would be the full 90 days from October 11th or something. Um, so th that was kind of the calendar. We have 45 days for the planning board, and then I guess technically 45 days from that point for the council to take their action. Um, we could do it earlier, can't we? I mean, do we have yeah, to? If we get the report earlier, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I thought, I, I don't mean to interject, I thought we did set an intermediate date for the public hearing to, con December to continue. December 16th was a date. Yes. Um, okay, and so with my goal, although it's it's a little bit lofty at the moment, is to have the planning board report reviewed tomorrow night okay. and, you know, furnished um, for Thursday the 10th um, so that it'll be available for December 16th. So whether or not the city council is ready and prepared to vote on December 16th, you would be, You. it looks like you would have all the information potentially available on the 16th. Then if a count, if the council is not ready to vote, then you would then continue the 16th meeting to some other date. I, ideally, it would be before February 2nd. Second. Second, second. So I think it is feasible whether... The question is whether you will, as a council, have everything you feel like you need on the 16th. I agree. Okay. All right. Well, we could vote on it, but here's a wrench in the works. I understand that our assessor is retiring, and she's a signatory on this document. How does that impact this, Mayor? <laughs> I mean, if we wait until January to approve this finally, or does that is that agreement something that comes in the very future, and then you have whoever is the assessor later on sign it. I mean, I don't know when the sign signing happens between you and Mike and everybody. I'm just curious if that particular issue becomes an issue with Lori retiring. I mean, we would seek, I mean, I, I you know, I would ask both the, the treasurer and the auditor to weigh in on that and then also get a hold of the Department of Economic Development and Housing um, around that, um, you know, one of my first questions would be, given when Lori is retiring and then posting it and then the hiring process, I, I don't see us having somebody on board at the earliest, you know, March. yeah, the beginning of March. So there must be a solution to this. Um, and and it's administrative. Um, well, I just look into that. I don't think yeah. we may not be ready on the 16th because we have other conflicts that need to absorb all of this. You know, the planning department's recommendation and our recommendations. Um, I'll leave it up to the finance committee, I think, can vote on this this evening. But on the 16th, we may not be ready to vote. And I don't know if that administratively causes a, a problem. Because I don't know the process after that with, with no assessor being available. So um, maybe you can look into that. Absolutely. Yep. So I'll take a motion if, if it's all right with the finance committee. Um, a motion to approve or make a recommendation to the full council to accept Chapter 121A as it relates to uh, 1 Ferry Street. Second. The motion before us is to make a recommendation of full council to accept the 121A agreement as presented by the mayor. Further discussion? Hearing none, Councilor Gomez? Yes. Councilor Connor? Yes. And Councilor Riz says yes. So this will come up on the 16th. Uh, uh, Mike and your team, you should be there just in case we do vote on something. Um, and Jeff, you've indicated that the planning department, planning board is not sending us anything that's going to throw a wrench in the works. Right. Uh, the planning board met, um, oh, I don't know the date, I'm sorry, two, a week ago, two weeks ago. And, you know, all the findings that they were asked to make were all favorable. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just not a, it, I don't expect anything to be problematic coming from the planning board. Um, well, we'll see where we're at on the 16th. Um, Maybe the president and I can discuss whether we think we should move forward. I, I just want everybody to have enough time to yeah. absorb all of this. Um, although it seems pretty clear to me that this is a this is a great that we're getting this blighted area finally done, and I think that's the bottom line. So thank you. Is there anything else to discuss? Everything else is dealt with. 
Are you raising your hand, Mayor? <laughs> no. I saw your finger go up. I didn't know if you were raising your hand. <laughs> okay, well then I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion to adjourn. Councilor Gomez. Yes. Councilor Connor. Yes. And I say yes. And I'd like to thank Councilors Peak and Flood for coming. It's great that we have Councilors here to get their questions answered, um, which may happen on the 16th with other Councilors. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody.